Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So we're now <clears throat> in Masech Tamidos. And the, the, the Mishnah is doing this, Rabbi Lezeb and Yaakov, who's the author of Masech Tamidos, he's doing this in a very orderly way for us. We take a look at diagram three. This white area would be considered the Har Habayas. You enter the Har Habayas <coughs> on the east. We always use the east because it's the simplest way to understand this. There are gates on the other sides. But you entered the east, you came through Shar Shushan Habira, and now you're in this white area, Har Habayas. And then you continue walking, and you went through a thin gate called the Soreg. And then you went into a place called the Chael. And then you entered now an eastern gate, and you're in the Ezra's Nashim. So we've learned about the Harabayas. We learned about the thin wall, the Soreg, which is the place where Goyim can't go past, and there were signs there, and the Greeks punctured 13 holes in there. We've learned about that. And then we learned about the Chael, this area between this Soreg and the wall of the Beis HaMikdash, and that was 10 Amos wide. We learned about the fact that in this Soreg, there were 12 steps, because the Ezus Noshim is six Amos higher than the Harabaya. So if you walk into the Harabaya, you would continue walking, you would go into the Soreg, and then when you got to the Chael, you would have to go up steps, 12 steps, each step is a half an Amos, so you're going up six Amos, and then you would enter into the Ezus Noshim. You're now six Amos, or 12, 13, 14 feet higher than what we'll call ground zero. Ground zero is the Harabayas. You're now about 13, 14 feet above the Harabayas in the Ezra's Nashim. And that's what we're up to. The next subject is going to be the Ezra's Nashim. You can already see in the Ezra's Nashim in the diagram that there are four rooms, one room in each corner of the Ezra's Nashim. And the subject here is going to be what is inside these four rooms. Of course, as you walk through the Ezra's Noshim, if you don't need to use any of these four rooms, you will come to the 15 steps. Again, each step is a half an armor high. 15 steps means seven and a half armors. So you entered the Ezra's Noshim, you were six armors higher than the Harabayas, you went up another 15 steps, and you went into Shar Nikonar, and that lifted you up another seven and a half Amos. So when you entered Shar Nikonar, and you came into this area inside this doorway, which is Ezra Sisral, it's thin. It's 11 Amos wide, 135 Amos long, depending how you want to look at it. It's 11 by 135. That's where a Yisrael can go. If he's standing in here, he is now 13 and a half Amos above ground zero, the Harabayas. So this white area, the rim of the page is Harabayas. If you walk through this gate and you came into this area in the base Hamikdash itself, assuming you were permitted to do so, you are now 13 and a half Amos. 29 feet or so, above the level of Harabayas. Again, the Esos Noshim is six Amos higher than Harabayas. You went up six steps, 12, I'm sorry, you went up 12 steps, and now you're gonna go up an additional 15 steps. So you've walked to get into the Esos Yisrael. If you came through the Ezra's Noshim, you walked up 12 steps, then you would have walked up 15 steps, you walked up 27 steps again to Ezra Yisrael. 27 steps and each step is half an armor. That means you're 13 and a half armors higher than you were when you first <coughs> entered Harabayas. And this is what the mission is gonna to discuss today, the four rooms at the corners of the Ezra Snashim and the Steps of Shah Nikonor.
So we're in Midos, Perik Bey's Mishnah Hay, for our numbering system. It's page 36. Ezra Sanoshim, Hoisa Orach Me Ushloshim Bechomesh, Arochav Me Ushloshim Bechomesh. The Ezra Sanoshim was a square, 135 Amos by 135 Amos. So you recall that when we looked at the Harabayas, <clears throat> the base Hamikdash, if we look, if we go to diagram one, the base Hamikdash is a structure inside the walls of the Harabayas. This is the eastern gate, the Shah Shushan Habira, that's the bridge where they took out the Parah Aduma to the Harazasim. The Ezra Snashim is here. The Azora is here. That rectangular building, Ulam and Hegel are in this new structure here. But there's a lot of space inside the wall of Harabayas that is not the base Hamikdash. And we went through the measurements. But the width of the whole inner structure is 135. Which, came, which led us to the calculation, which we're not going to go through again, but just in terms of width. If the Harabayas was 500, we, we learned the Harabayas, the entire struck, the entire area inside the walls of Harabayas are 500 by 500. And the structure of the base Hamikdash itself is 135 Amos wide. That means that from south to north, this is east, to west, but from south to north, or north to south, there's 500 amos here. The structure in the middle took up 135. So 500 less 135 equals 365, which means that there's 365 amos of open space between the southern side and the northern side. How was that split? So we learned that from the southern wall of the Harabayas until the wall of the base Hamikdash was 265 Amos. That was the largest open space on Harabayas. The wall, southern wall of the Harabayas to the wall of the base Hamikdash, 265. Base Hamikdash occupies 135 in width. Then from the wall of the base Hamikdash to the northern wall is 100 Amos. 265 plus 135 plus 100, 500. Now we're dealing with this square. This is the Ezra's Nashim. It's 135 going east to west, and it's 135 south to north. It's a square. And the Mishnah now says, the Arba Lashachos Hayu Ba'arba Mikzoseha. There were four rooms in the four corners of the Ezra's Nashim. Shall Arboyim Arboyim Amo. <clears throat> Each of them were 40 Amos. Now, we're going to go with the Pshat that this does not mean they were 40 by 40. It means that each room, now we're going to our famous diagram three. Each one of these rooms was 40 Amos going from the east to the west. But north to south, they were 30 Amos. So it was a room that was 40 by 30. 40 in what we'll call the length and 30 in what we'll call the width. So going from east towards the west, the room had a length of 40. Going from south to north, the room had a width of 30. So each of these rooms is 40 by 30. Velohoyu Makoros, they did not have roofs on them. They were open to the sky. And in the future, this is how <clears throat> the third base Hamikdash will look. There will be four rooms in the Ezra Snashim. The third base Hamikdash is a separate conversation. We don't even know what exactly the third base Hamikdash will look like. Yecheskel had a prophecy, and it's in Sefer Yecheskel. God revealed himself to Yecheskel and said, this is what the third base Hamikdash will look like. There are Svarim that tried to diagram the third base Hamikdash. It's much larger than the second base Hamikdash or the first base Hamikdash. 
and even Rashi himself in commenting on the third day Samikdash and the Rambam, these psukim will not be understood by us until Mashiach comes and explains most of these psukim to us. They're very complicated and difficult to understand exactly how you construct this huge building, the measurements, the rooms, and so that will be left for Melech HaMashiach. But there were certain things, well, before we started Mesech Tamidos, we said that it's a very, very amazing thing historically that before the second base Hamikdash was even built, the first base Hamikdash had been destroyed, the second base Hamikdash had not been built, and the Rebbe Shalom came to Yecheskel and gave him the prophecy of what the third base Hamikdash will look like. The, the second one hasn't even been built yet, and he's talking about the third one, which seems to indicate that when the second was built, the great men knew that it was going to be destroyed and was a temporary base Hamikdash and will lead to a third one. We're not going to talk about that today, but during the period between the first and the second, there was already a prophecy about the third. And when the Jews came back to Eretz Yisrael, those Jews that did come back to Eretz Yisrael from Bavel, and participate in building the second base Hamikdash with Ezra and Nehemiah, they built the second base Hamikdash to a great degree as the first base Hamikdash looked, although there were things they couldn't do in the second base Hamikdash because they were missing things. For example, the Oron was not in the second base Hamikdash. There were five major things missing in the second base Hamikdash. Base Hamikdash. There was no Oron. So the Kohen God on Yom Kippur, when he went into the Kodesh Kadoshim on Yom Kippur, there was no Oron in front of which to offer the Ketores. So how did he offer the Ketores? So in the second base of Mekdash, the Ketores was offered at the Evan Shasiya, the foundation rock. The Gemara and Yuma explains this is the rock from which the rest of the world was created. The world was created around the central point called Evan Shasiya. As we mentioned uh, earlier, we looked at a diagram. Uh, according to many, many poskim and Rishonim, etc., the Evan Shasiyah, this rock, the central rock, is what they call today the rock that's under the dome of the rock, the Evan Shasiyah. And once we accept that premise that that's the Evan Shasiyah, we can build the Azorah around it. In other words, we can diagram it. We can then diagram the Harabayas around it. And then we know where these things stood. <clears throat> When they built the second base on Mikdash, they built it to a great extent to the dimensions of the first base on Mikdash. And there were differences, however, some of them we'll get to. In building the second base on Mikdash, they also decided that they were going to make certain places in the base on Mikdash look like the third base on Mikdash. They already had heard the prophecy of Yecheskel about the third base Hamikdash and how that will look. And they decided to make the second base Hamikdash in some areas look already like the third base Hamikdash. How did they make that decision? What gave them the right to build the second base Hamikdash a little like the third? We will get to that later in the Masechta. But that was a decision made that parts of the second base Hamikdash will look like the third base Hamikdash. And this is one of them. They created these four rooms that had no roofs on them. And this is the part that is like the third base Hamikdash. They are not, they do not have roofs. And how do we know that that's what you need to do? So the, the Mishnah quotes a Pasik in Yechesko, Yechesko Perik Memvav, which is a prophecy of the third base Hamikdash and is being quoted to tell us how the second base Hamikdash was built. By Yotzi Eniel Achotzer the Rabboni Shalom took me out in the prophecy to the outer courtyard. The outer courtyard here means the Ezra Snoshim. Remember, we, kept, we keep on emphasizing the Azara, the Machene Shechina, begins when you enter this structure, Dushar Nikonor. This is called Azara. This, remember, there are three Machenos. Machene Yisrael is inside the wall of Yerushalayim. Machana Leviyah is inside the wall of the Harabayas. And Machana Shechina, the holiest area of the three, 
is inside the top area. This is called Azara. It has the outer Mizbeah, it has the Ulam, it has the Shulchan, the Menorah, the Mizbeah HaKtores, it has the Oron. This is Azara. And the Azara is Machne Shechina. If this Ezra's notion were not here, what would this area be? Har Habayis. And it would have the Kedusha of Har Habayis, which means it will be Machna Levia. And if it's Machna Levia, we already learned that a person who's been contaminated by a dead body can actually walk on the Har Habayis. We've discussed that at length. A person that's Tomei Meis can walk on the Har Habayis. There's no discussion, there's no debate about that. We saw that in the Rambam. It's not a Rambam halacha that someone argues with. It comes from a Gemara. <clears throat> and it comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. Because Moshe Rabbeinu lived in Machna Levia with the Levium in the desert. And he carried the bones of Yosef with him wherever he went. He took them out of Mitzrayim. So Moshe Rabbeinu had Yosef's bones with him in Machna Levia. So therefore, anything that's Machna Levia, a person that came into contact with the dead body, and even the dead body itself, can be on the Harabayas. So if this Ezra's Nashim were not built, then we're talking about Har Habayis, and a dead body would be able to go and walk in this, a dead body would be able to be brought into this area, or someone that's Tommy Mace would be able to walk in this area. However, once they built the Ezra's Nashim here, they gave it, they gave it additional Kedusha. It does not have the Kedusha of the Azara, they gave it a middle level Kedusha. And this is rabbinic Kedusha, because a biblical Kedusha has the Ezra's Noshim as Machna Levia, and a dead, per, a dead body can be brought in here. But once they built the Ezra's Noshim here, they made it holier than Har Habayis, but not as holy as Azara. And the level of holiness that they gave this is that not only can a person who's a Tomei Mace, a person that's Tomei Mace cannot come into the Esos Noshim, he can't even go into the Chayel, but even a Tavul Yom, a person who went to Mikvah, he can't go in here until, we talked about this, I believe last week, until sunset of the day or nightfall of the day that he went to the Mikvah. So if a person came into contact with a dead rat, he was a Tomei Sheretz, he could not, he was now Tomei, he immediately went to the mikvah for the same day. He couldn't come in to the Ezra Snoshim because he's called a Tavul Yom. He immersed himself that day, but he's not Tahar until nightfall of that, of that evening. So a Tavul Yom, he's Tome, but went to the mikvah, but didn't uh, pass through. A nightfall cannot enter the Ezra Snoshim. So this was given a rabbinic kedusha above the Machna Levia, but not as much as Azara. That's why it's so important to remember this is Azara, this is not Azara. This Azara is Machna Shechina. This is where if a, a person that's Tommy enters, Chas Rishon, he's high of Chorus, he's high of the heavenly death. This is the top place we're talking about. If you enter the Mikdash, a per, Betuma, a person got to bid his chayef chorus. It is in this area, which is machne shchina. That is not true for this area. This is machne levia. But once they built the Ezra's Noshim on it, rabbinically, they gave it more kedusha than machne levia harabayas, but not as much kedusha, obviously, as the Azura. So they decided to build this area and put four rooms in the corners and make the rooms look like the third base Hamikdash without ceiling, without a roof. So the Pasuk in Yechezka says, God took Yechezka out to the outer courtyard. This is the outer courtyard. This is the Machna Shechina, and God took him out to the courtyard. And God took me to the four corners of this courtyard. There was a chamber in each corner of this courtyard. In the four corners of the courtyard. 
And these rooms, these chambers were keturos. What does keturos mean? The Mishnah says, ve'en keturos elo she'enam makoros. The word keturos means that it has no roof. Why does the word keturos mean that something doesn't have a roof? Because when we talk about smoke in Lush and Kodesh, we talk about a kitar. Kitar ha'asham, vayal ashano ke'eshen ha'kirshon, we talk about a kitar. The keturos makes a kitar, it makes smoke rise. If you have a roof on top of a room, the smoke cannot rise to heaven. So we call a room in Lush and Kodesh that doesn't have a roof. It doesn't mean you're cooking in there for right now. It just means that because there's no roof, smoke can rise to heaven. So when we talk about a room that's kotur, it's a room that doesn't have a roof because smoke would be able to rise. So Yechezkel was brought back on the Shabbat into the outer courtyard to look at the third base Hamikdash. The Ezra Snoshim, the outer courtyard, had four rooms, one in each corner, and these rooms were keturos. They did not have roofs. Umahayu Misham shows the Mishnah asked, what did you do in these four rooms? The Romus Misrachis, the southeastern room, if you go back to diagram one, I've now handwritten in, it's not handwritten on your diagram, but now you can look at diagram one. Deromus Mizrachis, he haisa lishkas hanazirim. If you go right here, Deromus Mizrachis, you're on the east, you just entered the east Shushan Habira, you came to the Harabayas, you made a right turn, and you now, well, let's forget about the turn right now because we learned about turns. You're right here, you're southeast, and this chamber is called Lishkas Hanazirim. It's the room when the, a Nazir, when he came after he finished his Naziris, and the Naziris, a Stam Naziris was 30 days, and on the, 30th, the 31st day he came, he finished his Naziris, he would have to bring three carbonas, a carbon chatas, a carbon asham, and a carbon ola, along with a certain 20 chalos that he had to bring as an offering in the base Hamikdash. <clears throat> the shlomim that he brought, chatas, ola, and shlomim, the shlomim had an interesting rule. Besides the Kohen getting certain parts of every carbon shlomim, the Kohen got an additional part. He got the Zroa of the animal. And that Zroa had to be cooked inside the base Hamikdash, in a Mokum Kadosh. And this is the room where the Nazar would go to, and there would be a fire in there, or a stove. And the meat that the Kohen was going to eat he would have to cook in this room. And that's different than all other Kachim Kalim. Kachim Kalim, if someone comes into the base Hamikdash and wants to bring a carbon shlomim, he brings the carbon shlomim, he gives the parts that belong to the Kohen to the Kohen, and the Kohen can cook the carbon shlomim anywhere in Yerushalayim. If the Kohen has an apartment in Yerushalayim, he can go home with the meat, he can cook the meat in his house, and he can eat the meat in his house, as long as you're inside the wall of Yerushalayim. The Shalme Nazir, the Kohen Shlomim that a Nazir brought was different for reasons we're not going to go into. The Kohen cooked it in this room. And after he cooked it in this room, he was able to eat it anywhere in Yerushalayim. There's a reason why this was done here. The Nazir who took his haircut after the 30 days, he took his haircut in this room. And then after his hair was cut, he had to take the hair and put it on the fire. There's a pot on the fire in which the meat is cooking. And under the, under the pot, he would throw his hair into that fire. Sounds like a halakha on Lagba Omer. But we're not talking about a halakha on Lagba Omer. We're talking about a nazir. He got his hair cut. He was in this southeast chamber of the Ezra's Nashim. He took his hair cut, the meat was cooked. As the meat was cooking in the pot, he burned his hair under the pot. So the Mishnah says, 
He hoist a page thirty seven. He hoist a lishkas hanazirim. Shasham hanazirim of vashlem eshalmeim. That's where Nazir would cook his carbon shlomim. Or megalchen esaoran. He would also cut his hair. Or meshalchen tachas adud. He would throw the hair under the dud under the pot. Mizrachis Saphonis. He now is going to come <coughs> northeast. And back to diagram one. He's here, northeast. And that was called Lishkas Ha'etzim, the wood room. Shasham HaKohanim Bali Mumen Maslin Ha'etzim. It is there that Kohanim, who are Bali Mumen, would check the wood to make sure there were no worms in the wood. And the Kohanim that got this job were Kohanim who had blemishes. They had a mum. A coin that has a mum cannot do the avod in the base hamikdash, but this is not a true avoda, and they wanted to give the bali mumin the privilege of doing something in the base hamikdash that was tzorich. It was a necessity for the korban. They couldn't do avoda, so they have this room where kohanim who are bali mumin can go in there, and they were taught how to inspect the wood. It's the wood that would go on the outer mizbech, the large mizbech upon which they burnt the karbonos. That's diagram number three. That's this large mizbech. There's a small mizbech inside the heichel, but that's only for ketores, no animals. The animal sacrifices were brought on the large mizbech. And on that large mizbech, you had to put wood that had no worms in it. So in, there was in this room, that Kohanim who are Bali Mumin would check for the wood. We call H&Mtsabot a wood that they found a worm in Possel Mel Gabi Mizbeach. It was Possel for the Mizbeach. Tzfonis Maravis, and now we go to north, west, the third chamber. Tzfonis Maravis, he hoist a lishkas hamet that was the room that a person that had a tzaras used. In that room, there was a mikvah. A person that Lo'aleinu had a negat tzaras, he had to go to the mikvah three times. First of all, he was sent out, he was sent out of the three Jewish camps. Chas if somebody had a tzaras, he couldn't be inside the city of Yerushalayim. Remember, the wall of Yerushalayim Entering the wall of Yerushalayim meant you entered Machne Yisrael until you get to Harabayas. That wall, past that wall, is Machne Leviya. When you enter the Azor, you're in Machne Shechina. A Metzora cannot be inside Yerushalayim. And in the days of the Machne in the desert, a Metzora could not be within the Machne Yisrael, which were the 12 flags around the camp. He had to be sent all the way out of the camps. Now, this Mitzorah, the Kohen came and checked on him. The Kohen found at some point that the Neged Saras is subsiding. It's going away. The Kohen went through a process, Chutz Lamachene, outside the three camps. That's with the two birds. One bird was shechted by, um, by the Kohen. One bird was sent free. That whole process, Chutz Lamachene. And on that day, the Mitzorah went to mikvah one. He then was able to go home, quote unquote, complicate Allah for the Mitzorah. <clears throat> and then he had to wait seven days. On the seventh day, he went to the mikvah again. Now between the seventh day, there's going to be an eighth day for the Mitzorah, because on the eighth day, the Mitzorah is going to bring his karbonas. On the seventh day, he's going to tovel again in the mikvah. And what's the rule about being tovel in the mikvah? In order to change the status in any which way, you have to wait to nightfall of that night. So the Mitzorah was tovel on the seventh day after the Kohen found him to be healing. Second mikvah. He had to wait the whole day until nightfall. And then he, quote unquote, got a status of Tfuh Yom, which is not important for us right now. And then the next morning, on the eighth day, he's called a, he's, he's a Mechusa Kippur because a Mitzorah does not become Tahar until he brings a carpet. Many Tumas, a person becomes pure by going to Mikvah and waiting till nightfall. He doesn't bring a carpet. A Mitzorah must bring a carbon. 
So even after his seven days are over, and he went to the mikvah twice, and the evening uh, passed over the second three, where he can't go into the base HaMikdash. He has to wait till the eighth day, and on the eighth day, he brings a carbon. But before he brings that carbon on the eighth day, he went into the Lishkas Hamid Sorahim, and he went to the mikvah there. And then when he came out, he brought his carbonus. And that's going to be a subject that we'll talk about more in the shir tomorrow about these carbonos, about how he brought these carbonos. He would go to Shai Nikonor, and that's where Shai Nikonor is going to become again a subject of <clears throat> the Mitzvah standing at the Shai Nikonor. And again, we're going to go into that area tomorrow, the fourth, the third room, which is the Lishka Samitsaroim. Marobis Deromis, southwest, which is the fourth chamber, right here. Amar Rebelez ben Yaakov, Rebelez ben Yaakov said, Rebelez ben Yaakov is really the author of Masech Bamidas, Shachachti Mahoysa Meshameshes. I forgot. I don't remember what I was told this fourth chamber was used for. Abishol Omer Abishol says, Shom Hoyanosnim Yain Vashemin, he hoy Sinikras Lishkas Beishmanya. Abishol says, I'm telling you, I remember what it was. It was called Lishkas Beishmanya because that's the room in which they stored oil, which was needed for different things for the menorah, for mixing with a mincha, a flower offering. Wine was needed for the wine that was poured on them as bad. And this was called Lishkas Beishmanya. And again, we're going to take a look at that as well tomorrow. I want to finish the Mishnah because I said that the Mishnah would connect to Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef. V'chalaka hoysa b'rishona. Originally, if we go back <coughs> to diagram one, I'm sorry, diagram three, right? Our famous diagram of the whole base Hamikdash. This is the Esdras Noshim. So the Mishnah says originally the walls of the Ezra Snoshim, the inside walls, were flat. They were just walls. V'hikifua ketzotzra. I'm reading the Mishnah according to Rashi's Pirish and not according to the Rambam's Pirish. And then they built into the walls the southern, northern, and eastern wall, not the western wall of the Esos Nashim. The western wall of the Esos Nashim has the 15 steps of Nikonor on it. So we're talking about three walls. One, two, three. On these three walls, they put like pegs into the wall or L's, brackets, permanently inserted brackets on three walls of the Esos Nashim. So when Sukkis came, and they had to have the Simchas Beis Hashem Eva, they would then take planks and build a balcony. And then after Sukkot was over, they would take the planks off. The brackets would remain in the wall. And every year, Sukkot, they would put those planks back up on the brackets, and they would have a balcony for women. They put brackets onto the walls of the Ezra's Nashim, again on three sides. So the women can be upstairs on the balcony and look down during the Simcha space And men are down below in the Ezra's Nashim. It's kind of funny, the men are in the Ezra's Nashim, but that's what it's called. The room is called Ezra's Nashim, and the women are on the balconies on the, in the Ezra's Nashim. In order that there not be a mix between men and women, so the women are on the balcony and the men are below. And this, again, we'll believe that to discuss tomorrow. Uh, this is our source for having a machitza in shul. The source for men and women not being mixed together is in this Beis Hamikdash, where they put the women on the balcony. And in the Ezra's Noshim, going back to diagram three, in the Ezra's Noshim, there are 15 steps. 
Olos mitochol es Yisrael, that go from the Ezra's Noshim into the Ezra's Yisrael, Keneged Chamesh Esrei Meilashet Betehillim, and these 15 steps represent, or are Keneged, the 15 Shir HaMailas that David said in Tehillim, Shalem HaLavim Omer Bashir, that the Simcha Space HaShavayv, the Levim stood on these 15 steps and sang their Shir. We are not talking about the shear that the Levium sang every day. The Levium sang every day a shear at the Korban Tomit Shal Shachar and a Korban Tomit Shal Bein Arbayim. We're not talking about that. When the Levium sang those songs, they were inside Shar Nikonar and they were standing on a Dukhan, they were standing on a Bama when they sang. Here's the Mizbeach where the Karbonas are being brought and the Levim are near the Mizbeach and the Dukhan singing the Shir, which we today call the Shir Shel Yom. And they're singing the Shir Shel Yom right next to the Mizbeach. These 15 steps, which lead to Shar Nikonar, those steps were used for Levim singing Simchas Beis Hashel Eva only. And those 15 steps were built connected the 15 Shir Hamalos that David said in Telem. And now the Mishnah says, Lahoyu trutot, they were not regular steps. A regular staircase is like square. It's one step on top of another, one step on top of another. But this staircase was not trutot, they were not square. El mukafos kachatzigorin. You see in your diagram three, it is a semicircle. The steps could have been built just as a square, one step on top of another, going straight up into the door. It wasn't built that way. Was built as a semicircle, and those are the 15 steps. We're going to learn tomorrow about the Lishka Sa'exim, which we mentioned. It's in your diagram one. The Lishka Sa'exim is the north, the northeast room in the Ezra's Noshim. Northeast room. We have a Kabbalah that comes from the Gemara, at least according to one Shita. And according to one Shita, it's Rabbi Shimon Bayachoy Shita. That the Oro was hidden under this chamber in the Ezra's Noshim. That's where they eventually put the Oron when they hit it at towards the end of the first base Hamikdash. They opened the, the floor of the Lishka Soetzim. They opened the floor of the Lishka Soetzim and they put the Oron beneath there. And according to those shitas, that's where the Aron is. There are other shitas that say that the Babylonians, when they invaded and came into the Beis Hamikdash, they took the Aron with them. There are other shitas in the Gemara that hold that at the end of the first Beis Hamikdash, knowing that the Beis Hamikdash was going to be invaded, they took the Aron and hid it under that room, the Lishkas Ha'etzim. We're going to talk more about this Lishkas Ha'etzim Blineder tomorrow. We're going to come back to a lot of points on this mission tomorrow. I wanted to talk about this separation between men and women and where we get this from. Obviously, we get it from the base Hamikdash, where there was a balcony put on the Ezus Nashim so that the women can attend the Simcha Space Hashaweva. So there was a separation between men and women. There's a little problem with creating this balcony system, and the Gemara talks about it in Sukkah. The Gemara in Sukkah and Afnun Aleph Amid Beis says, How can you decide to add a structure to the base Hamikdash? The base Hamikdash. Were, was built according to dimensions that were given to David HaMelech that he passed to Shlomo, and Shlomo built it according to these divine instructions. You can't walk into the base of Mikdash and say, why don't we build another room? Why don't we expand a little? That was a problem with the second base of Mikdash as well when Hordas expanded it. But 
you can't just walk into the base of Mikdash and say, let's decorate a little. Let's uh, put up a new room. There's a Pasik in Divri Hayomim that says, the Gemara quotes it, Hakol Bechsav, Miyad Hashem, Olai Hiskil. That God HaChose and Nosen Hanavi told David HaMelech, literally, and he wrote it down according to the Mepharshim. David HaMelech wrote down these instructions and these dimensions, and there was a Ksav, there was like a notebook, and he passed it to Shlomo. These are divine instructions. And somebody woke up one day, I'm saying that in a, in, in sort of in a language, just so that we're talking about a story. Somebody woke up one day and said, well, we ought to separate the men and the women at Simcha Space Hashem. And the Gemara discusses what happened before the balcony. Before the balcony, sometimes the women would be in the Ezra's Nashim and the men would be outside on the Harabayas. And then they put the men in the Ezra's Nashim, they put the women on the Harabayas. None of these plans work. So the Gemara says they finally decided they were going to put up these brackets. And every year they would put planks on the brackets and there would be a Simcha Space Joev, women above, men below. The Gemara is, how can you do that? You can't add a structure to the base of Mikdash. You can put men inside and women outside, or vice versa, but you can't create a new structure. Amaraf, Saraf tells us, Kro Ashkochu Udrosh. The people, the, the, the great Tamid Echachomim of that generation, during, let's assume, the second base of Mikdash, they found a Pasik that gave them permission. They darshan the Pasik, they gave them permission to build this Ezra's Nashim. Where is this Pasik? This is a Pasik in Zechariah, and it talks about Mashiach ben Yosef. It said Mashiach ben Yosef, we learned about it in the Rashi in Yeshaya. It says that Ephraim will embrace Yehuda, and Yehuda will embrace Ephraim. They won't be jealous of each other, Rashi says. That's Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, who will be able to join together and cooperate to bring the Geula Shlema for the Jewish people and for the whole world. So we learned about Mashiach ben Yosef. This is the place in the Gemara where the Gemara mentions Mashiach ben Yosef. The Gemara says, how do you build a structure in the Beis HaMikdash? You can't add anything to the Beis HaMikdash. So Gemara says there was a Pasuk that they learned, they got a permission, they got a heter to be able to do this. Where? In Zechariah chapter 12, there's a discussion there. There's a Zechariah prophesizes, it's not a discussion. It's how he prophesizes about a funeral, an unbelievable funeral that will take place in the future. And the Pasik says, Zechariah prophesized, Vesafta ha'aretz mishpachos mishpachos levad. The, the hespedim, at this funeral. The eulogies that will be said at this funeral, the families will be sitting separately. Mishpachas beis David levad, unashayim levad. David HaMelech's family will be sitting separate from their wives. That's the possible. This hespin, this, this eulogy that will be said over some great person, and this eulogy will take place in the city of Yerushalayim. It'll be massive, massive funeral. And at this massive funeral, there'll be eulogies. And David HaMelech's family, and David HaMelech, the wives of that family, will have to sit separately. Okay, that's what the Pasuk says. So now the Gemara says, Amru v'alodvarim kal v'chomer. So the, 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 the Tamid HaChachom that lived in the time of the second base HaMikdash, and they saw that there was beginning to become men and women were mingling at the same with space Joeva. They said, we have to do something about this. They said, what we're going to do is we're going to build a balcony. But we can't build a balcony. You're not allowed to add to the base. I make dash. They found this Pasuk and they said, this Pasuk tells us what? That men and women must be separate when? At a funeral. So the Gemara says, Imagine, let's make a Kalvachoma. The future prophecy of Zechariah is at a time when we're dealing with a hespid. It's the middle of a funeral. That's not usually the time where men and women start joking around with each other and we have to be worried about things not being happening that are appropriate. It's the middle of a funeral. 
And therefore, people are not make a rosh during a funeral. And there's no Yetzirah at this funeral. This funeral is going to take place, Rashi says, after God vanquishes the Yetzirah. Right? That's a, an idea of Mashiach. Okay? Eventually, God's going to rid the world of the Yetzirah. So now imagine this thing. There's this massive funeral. We don't know whose funeral it is, but there's this massive funeral going on in Yerushalayim, and the eulogies are being said. Nobody's laughing. There's a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous special person who is no longer alive. Who he is, we'll see in a moment. He's no longer alive. And the eulogies are being said. We're in the middle of a funeral. Nobody's fooling around. There's no Yetzirah anymore because this is a world of post Yetzirah. And the Pasek still says, the highest still prophesizes that at this funeral, men and women will sit separate. There's no Yetzirah, and we're in the middle of a funeral, and men and women still have to sit separate. Kal v'chomer, certainly, achshav, shasukin, besimcha, v'yetzirah, sholet behem, alachas kama v'kama. Certainly, before Mashiach comes, and in the simchas beis hashoev, it's, it's not a funeral. It's in the middle of a joyous event. Everybody's dancing, everybody's singing, everybody's in a good, good mood. They're in a wonderful mood. And there's still a Yetzirah present. In the time of the second base of Mikdash, there was a Yetzirah, there still is. So if when there's no Yetzirah, and you know, people are at a funeral, you need to keep men and women, men and women separately, as Zechariah prophesizes, certainly when the base of Mikdash stood, and there was a Yetzirah, and it's not a funeral, it's a happy event. We certainly have to keep men and women apart. And from this Pusik, they learned out that you can keep, you can build these, these uh, brackets onto the wall of the Ezra's Nashim and then put balcony up for the simplest space I shall favor. And this becomes our reference point, our source for our shuls to have separation between men and women. It comes from the base Hamikdash. And it's learned out from Zechariah's prophecy about the future. Rabbi Yosheh Ben Salavechik, I, I read at one time, he was talking about the original break off of the, of the Christians from the Jewish people. And originally, it was difficult to tell who was Jewish and who was not. The original generation were basically Jews who just went off, but they, were, they looked like Jews. They had beards, they had payers, they dressed like Jews. They just believed in some nonsense. Rabbi Yosheb Salavechik had some historical references that one of the ways, if you, you need, a person needed to daven. So you walked into a shul. How do you know whether that shul is a shul or it's a Jews for Jesus shul? How did you know in those days what, what, what uh, building you walked into? Everybody had beards and payas, and people were davening. They were probably using the same words. How did you know? When you walked in there, am I in a Jewish place or am I in a Jew for Jesus place? Rabbi Yoshev Salvechik says one of the points of reference was to see if there was a separation between men and women. If there was a balcony or a machitza, as we've come to know it, then you knew you were in a Jewish house of worship. If there was no balcony or machitza, then you knew you were in a place of a Jew, a, you know, Jews for Jesus kind of place, because they gave up on the separation between men and women. That was one of the original things that differentiated between the Jew who was Shema Teva Mitzvah and the Jew who went off and became a Jew for Jesus, Rahman of Islam. That was a, one of the original reference points. So this is a very, very, very sensitive point for Klal Yisrael. <clears throat> and unfortunately, those that went off, the Reform, the Conservative, etc., they got rid of the Mechitza, the Mechitza is something that comes from Beis HaMikdash. The Mechitza is something that comes from a prophecy of Zechariah. And it's, that's why it became, it, and it remains a very touchy subject. And the height of the Mechitza. And what should the Mechitza be made out of? And that we'll discuss a bit tomorrow about can women sit on a balcony where men can still see them? There are shuls that have balconies, but you, men can see the women, the women can see the men. Or you have shuls that have elevated women's sections. They're 10, 15 feet off the ground with a little gate. 
and the men can still see the women, the women can still see the men. And there's some achlogis that post him whether that kind of mechitza is acceptable. Rav Moshe Feinstein wrote Shuvas about it, the Satna Rav's appointed Sadhguru Bokha, Rav Moshe Feinstein, they discussed this subject. But the source of the subject is Beis Hamikdash. And how did they know they can do this in the Beis Hamikdash from the prophecy of Zechariah? Now, who is this person that died that's having this massive funeral and all these eulogies? And the, the, the science of the Davidic dynasty are actually sitting at this funeral. And it's a funeral in Yerushalayim. Hi, Espey, the Maya Vidate, the Gemara says. What is this Hespit about? Pligi bar Abdosev Rabbonin. Chad Omer al Mashiach ben Yosef Shenerag, Vachad Omer al Yetzah Hora Shenerag. One sheet is that this funeral is about Mashiach ben Yosef who will be killed in a war. He won't survive the war of Gog Magog, according to this Kabul. And there'll be a tremendous Hespit a tremendous eulogy, a tremendous funeral in Yerushalayim for the Mashiach ben Yosef. And this is the meaning of the Pasuk. If this is a prophecy of Zechariah chapter 12, and the prophecy continues in chapter 12 of Zechariah, they will look to me with respect to the one who was Stabbed, in other words, killed. Vesaftu alav kemispeit al hayochid, and the eulogies will be said on him as if he was somebody was saying a eulogy. God forbid, on an only child of a family that died. It will be so precious the person that passed away. It will be like an only child passed away. And this is the Gemara's reference to Mashiach ben Yosef. We have a Kabbalah that Mashiach ben Yosef does not necessarily, a fact, have to die in this war. And in fact, in Nusa Ari Sidurim, there's a prayer in the Shemona Esrei, and it's inserted in the Siddur, in the middle brachis, where a person can pray that Mashiach ben Yosef be saved by the Rebbe Mishalolam from Armilus, Remember, we discussed Armilus. It says that the Mashiach, we learned it today, the Mashiach will kill an evil person. The Targum Yonas and Ben Uziel said that evil person is Armilus. So if we go back, that means Mashiach Ben David will kill Armilus, this evil ruler. And that will be after Amilus Chasvisholom kills Mashiach ben Yosef. Amilus Chasvisholom will kill Mashiach ben Yosef. There'll be this tremendous eulogy funeral in Yerushalayim. Men and women will be separate, and then Mashiach ben David will come and kill Amilus. But the, according to the Ari and Kabbalah, it is not an absolute that Mashiach has to die in that war. We can save him through our tefillahs. And there's again an insert in Nusach Ari Sadurim and other Sadurim. When I say Nusach Ari, I'm not talking about Lubavitch Sadurim. There's a Nusach Ari. Lubavitch is David, a form of Nusach Ari, but there's an apt, a real Nusach Ari Siddur or a Ramchal Siddur that follows in Nusach Ari. And there's an insert in the Shemona Esrei, a prayer that God protect uh, Mashiach ben Yosef from Armilus. What is this Mashiach ben Yosef? What is he out to do? Why do we need two Mashiachs for? Rav Kook explained this, and now we're going to speak a bit about the Das, the Bunas, and the Ramchal. 